Good morning and Shabbat Shalom to everyone. It's good to be back. I'm back in Texas, back in Texarkana. Had a, a wonderful trip and uh, hello to my friends out in Colorado, my old friends and my new friends that we met in the various places we went. I hope some of you are joining in. I know that you have a little bit of time before your Shabbat gathering meets. Uh, and so, uh, especially with the time change, you might have a few minutes to listen and then come back and catch us on YouTube. And for, uh, for South Africa, how's it? How are you doing down there? And for uh, Australia, good day, mate. Uh, also, hello, uh, all, you, all you folks from New Zealand, uh, 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 for, for you folks from Israel. And to England, just hello, how are you doing, my friends? And all over the world, blessings to you. Uh, good Sabbath to you. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Well, it is the week of Parsha, Parsha Nassau. Uh, I was in Colorado for last week, and we talked about Shabbos, the day of Pentecost, the season of counting of Sepharit HaOmer. And so, therefore, it's, it's, I sort of let, let uh, Bamidbar, Parsha Bamidbar, and Sefer Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, uh, sneak up on me. Uh, Actually, it didn't let it sleep up on me, but we didn't talk about it. And so uh, we want to talk about that. We'll kind of combine Parsha Bamidbar uh, and Parsha Naso and sort of look forward through this entire season that's coming up. It is a significant season. This is stage four of the ultimate extreme bridal makeover. This is uh, for higher level. This is for graduates. This is for folks who have been through the separation protocols, uh, been through the, the Mishkan uh, building protocols, been through the interaction and communication teaching protocols of Leviticus, been through the uh, Kedusha uh, re recovery uh, and em embracing protocols uh, later there, and then also been through the uh, Geula uh, training protocols as to how to look at everything through eyes of redemption. So now we are in the time of Bamidbar. I call this an eight-week boot camp or an eight-week uh, survival training program. And it lasts for about eight weeks, sometimes nine, even leap years. But eight years, eight weeks usually. And during this eight weeks, we will be tested to the limits of our patience. We will be tested to the limits of our spirituality. We will be uh, triggered emotionally. We will be uh, reach flashpoints of uh, appetite and urge and desire. We, we will see all the flesh uh, either come to the surface and bear uh, bitter fruit or be pruned and be trimmed and submitted to the uh, plan of the Holy One. This is our season of figuring out who we are. Uh, and so we're going to have a little bit of discussion about that. I want to give us our what I call our kingdom alertness and orientation check before we go off into the wilderness, into the desert, and before he, the Holy One allures us as he says in Hosea, allures us into the wilderness. He is planning this. This is not the enemy doing this to us. Our creator, our beloved, our bridegroom king is alluring us into the wilderness, into this eight-week season of extreme testing and trial to see what, let us know at least, what's inside of us, what's still left over from Egypt, what needs to go and how to overcome and transcend. So the question, first question on our kingdom alertness and orientation checklist is this. Do you know who you are? Not who the society tells you are. Not who the, the look in the mirror as compared to everybody else who looks in the mirror tells you you are. Do you know who you are? Alert or, or orientation number one, do you have your identity down? Do you know who you are? Uh, we have tried to get that clear in in book of Exodus, uh, from the book of Genesis, actually, but all the way through that, and then through Leviticus. We are the kingdom of priests. We are the holy nation. We are the Am Segula. We are the chosen people. We are the great nation. So many things that we are individually and collectively. Do you know who you are? Because if you don't, if you don't have that fully grasped, then you will be swayed by the stuff that sways other people. You will be uh, tossed about by every wind of doctrine. You will be caught up in every wave, a tidal wave of emotion. You will be uh, beset by every form of, of distraction, 
obsession, <laughs> perversion, as it hits you. It, it will, it will re, 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 revolt you or it will entice you And if you don't know who you are. If you know who you are, you'll have an anchor. So the first question is, do you know who you are? Personhood. Do you know who you are? Uh, person identity. Second question in the alertness and orientation test is, do you know where you are? <laughs> Do, this, if you go to the hospital or you go into a medical clinic or you, uh, the EMTs are called out to your place and you've had a, a fall or you've had an accident, they're going to ask you these questions. Who are you? What's your name? Then th that's the alertness uh, orientation number one. The second question asks you, do you know where you are? Uh, do you know where you are? Because if you don't know spatially where you are, they know you've got some sort of impairment, cognitive impairment that's come by virtue. So they ask you where you are. Do you know where you are? We're at Mount Sinai in this, in this process. We're in the fourth uh, division of Torah. We are now in a season of this testing. Do you know where you are? And so if you know where you are, then you can interpret all things that you see in light of where you are, in light of where you've been, in light of where you're going, and in light of where you are. This is an important orientation process. Do you know, third question, do you know what time of day it is? Do you know what day it is? They would ask you, is it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Uh, what day of the month is? Do you know what day, time, and season it is? This is important for us to know as we go off into this eight-week season of testing, eight-week season of, of seeing if we can get a pilgrimage mindset and approach. Do you know what time of day it is? We'll talk a little bit about time and sequence in a moment, I hope. Question number four, though. We have the alert and orientation, uh, alert and oriented times four issue. The fourth question is, do you know what has happened to you? <laughs> do you know how you got here, in other words? Do you know why you are here at this particular time? Do you know the strategy involved? Do you know the sequence of things that are involved? This is the fourth orientation question. Uh, it's about circumstance and calling, where, where you fit in this whole scenario. Because this is a kingdom alertness and orientation briefing, I will ask you a fifth question. And the fifth question, which would not be asked to you necessarily in the hospital or by the EMTs, is do you know what to expect in this season? Internally, what you're going to feel, what you're going to experience. Externally, what you're going to have to deal with. Do you understand that? Do you understand it from what's going on with you and what's going on with others? Do you understand what to expect and how to and how not to react to what you're going to see and what you're going to experience. Uh, this is the preparation and mission and focus orientation of the kingdom. You must know, you must be prepared for what's coming. And second of all, you must keep your mission focus during the time. So this is the question as we enter into the survival training protocols. Uh, get ready, we're about to get tossed out in the wilderness. So, next thing, Sefer ben Midbar. Uh, stage four revelation. Uh, I hope you understand. We've been through some stuff together. We've been through Genesis. We've been through Exodus. We've been through the, the narratives of the patriarchs. We've been, we've been kicked out of some really nice places or some really bad places, as the case may be. We, we got basically expelled by the Holy One from Babylon and Ur of the Chaldees and, and, from, uh, and, and from Haran and the whole eastern Mesopotamian area. We, got, we pretty much got expelled from that by the Holy One. We got kicked out of Egypt as well. We got sent out of Egypt. We've been sent out of Gerar. We've been sent out of the land of the Philistines. Uh, we've been sent out of the house of Laban. We, we, have been, we have been told over and over again that we do not belong in the places where the world frequents. We do not belong where other people belong. We have, a, have another home. We have another connection. We have an eternal uh, bond with the land of Israel and with the God of Israel. So this issue of do we, we and we came through uh, we came through the wilderness we came through Mount Sinai we came through uh, the Sea of Reeds we've come through some experiences together so we're not beginners in this process hopefully if you're with me today I, I hope you you understand you're not a beginner you've been brought to this point and this point you are ready for it you have been prepared for it and now the question is are we uh, willing to participate in the training program the inspired narrative is going to describe of, of numbers is going to describe the travels, the transitions, the, the shifts, the transformations that take place between Mount Sinai and our uh, time under the hoopa with our bridegroom king, the time of intense bonding with our king, 
and deployment when we are sent into the places of the world to serve him, to honor him, to be his diplomats, to be his ambassadors. With the, This is the long and winding road book. Uh, we will be traumatized. <laughs> we, we have been traumatized as slaves of this world, but we are going to be uh, set up as a, as a kingdom of priests, disciplined dis diplomats of his kingdom. I will warn you, there will be some dropouts along the way. There will be some who just decide it's not worth it. Some who decide that the world is more important and the things of the world and their attitudes and their, their appetites are more important. So uh, it's okay. If they have to choose to, to lay out, the Holy One will call them in the next generation. He will keep calling generation after generation until someone hears and comes. All right. So we'll be talking about Numbers, well, I kind of start with 1-1, one, one, but the partial will start with Numbers 4-21, and it will go through 7-89. I uh, say we'll start with 1-1 one, one because I wasn't here last week to talk to you about this, so you get a little bit of an of a upgrade uh, with regard to two weeks this week, even though the partial is only for one. This is introduction to the proving ground, the kingdom proving ground, the, the issue of whether or not we are faithful servants or whether we are wanting stuff from him, we're wanting him to serve us. It, it, this kingdom uh, serving, proving ground is the wilderness, and it is where it is, uh, the circumstances are not always great. Have we developed in our travels thus far? Have we developed and nurtured ears to Shema, the voice of the Holy One? This is going to find, it become really critical. Most of us have ears to Shema, the network news. We have ears to Shema, the entertainment world, and its set of liberties. We have ears to Shema, maybe the profession or the, the business that we're in, and its leaders and its talking heads. We, we, we have uh, ears to hear the ideologues and the political leaders and what they have to say. We have ears to hear the educators. Uh, and the religious uh, talkers, we, we have ears to hear all that, but the real question is not that. The question is, can, do we have ears to, to Shema to really pay attention to and tune into the voice of the Holy One? That will be critical survival technique number one. He told us about this at Maro. If you Shema my voice, everything else is contingent upon that factor. The Holy One spoke at, at Mara and said, if you Shema my voice, then all these other things will happen to you. Good things. Second question, do we have a clue yet who we are called to be, what we are called to do, how we are called to impact our world, our family, our household, our neighborhood, our city, our workplaces, our marketplaces, the institutions, the times, the seasons, the bloodlines that we connect with. Do we have a clue yet what he has called us to, how important our calling is in his grand plan? Do we have an idea what we're going to become? I, I had a chance to talk with a group, with our one of several groups in Colorado this week, and, and I, one of the things I, I, I was so excited to focus on and talk to you about is this issue of, of us becoming like Yeshua. This is the focus of the entire New Testament, as people want to call it. That we would, that human beings, that, that those of the covenant, that those who follow after him would become like him. Not just that we would believe in him, not that we would build some sort of an institution based upon our belief system, but that we would become like him. And this idea of do we know who, what we're called to become? Do we know what the Messiah, uh, how he operates, how he re interacts, how he relates, how he shows patience and yet keeps prodding, moving forward? To picture the conversations with the woman at the well. Picture the conversations with Zacchaeus. Picture the way in which he disciplined and discipled Peter. Kepha. Picture how he did these things. This is the way the Messiah works. It requires patience, not we come in and slap them and tell them what to do, and they follow. Yeshua didn't do that. We will not do that. We will become like him. We will learn how to interact in a way that keeps pushing the envelope further without driving people away. Question number three. Have we learned how to approach and absorb and exude and operate out of our king's holiness, his kedusha? It's his energy. 
That's the energy out of which, the creative energy out of which he operates is this Kedusha holiness. That's why he's been talking to us about holiness all through the book of Leviticus. We had the longest discourse of Torah is about Kedusha. It's about appropriating, uh, experiencing, and then communicating holiness to other people, to the world. So do we get the, uh, the how to approach, uh, absorb, uh, exude, and then operate in and out of Kedusha? That is our challenge. We won't be able to make it through the wilderness. We'll be one of those that fall out along the way unless we learn how to operate in his Kedusha. Do we know his holy things? Do we carry his holy things? The first thing he talks about in this Parsha is about things we carry. Particularly, he's going to talk about two tribes. Last week at the end of Numbers, at the end of uh, Midbar, he talked about what the Kahati carry, a particular clan of the Levites carry. They carry the, they're masters of the, of the, uh, of the places of interaction. They're, they're masters of the, the articles, the instrumentalities, the, the uh, furnishings of the tabernacle. They carry these. This is what we, we carry the bronze labor. This is the Kahati. We have a design. Can you carry, do you carry the bronze labor into everything you do? Do you carry the, the, uh, the brazen altar? Do you, carry the, uh, do you carry the table of showbread with you? Do you carry the light of the menorah with you? Do you carry the uh, altar of incense with you? Are you carriers of these things? Do you carry the Ark of the Covenant? Do you carry the Torah and its tablets? Do you carry, do you carry the, the mercy seat and the cherubim? Do you carry the manifest presence of the Holy One above all? Do you carry these things? That was the mission of the Kahati. And he's a, a picture. Every picture tells a story. And this story... This picture tells the story of we are going to have to learn to carry the Kedusha, carry the holy things, carry these aspects of interaction with the Holy One in every facet of life. Then th this week we'll start with Gershon, the, the descendants of the tribe or the, the clan of Gershon. And then we have the, the tribe or the clan of Merari and what they carry. And we'll see that we are all called to be carrying aspects of the Holy One's Kedusha. His holiness, his holy things. What holy things are you carrying? What holy things is the world needing from you? We don't want to carry the profane things. We don't want to be carriers of the common, ordinary things. We can't fulfill our purpose if we're carriers of the common or the profane things. If we're speaking like everybody else is speaking, if we're talking about the same stuff everybody else is talking about, if we're acting out in the same way everybody else is acting out, if our emotions are out of control the way everybody else's emotions are out of control, if we get outraged over things of the earth, if we get upset about, about things people say, we trigger on vocabulary. We trigger on narrative. If we're doing that, then we're not carrying the holy thing. So this is our challenge, and this is our season of testing, transformation, and transition. Our season of testing, of transformation, and of transition will we continue to trigger the way the rest of the world triggers will we respond to the flashpoints that the rest of the world is responding to or will we stay focused on the holiness and the kedusha of the holy one and what we are called to carry into this world that's our challenge <laughs> will we handle the testing ground the way the holy one tells us to will we stay on mission or focus Will we leave the desert, that we, the wilderness that we go into, better for us being there? Or will we leave it and each other worse for the wear? Here's the real challenge. It's not whether we'll survive. We should survive. We are prepared to survive. We are prepared to thrive. The question is not will we prepare, will we survive or thrive. The ultimate question for king's men, for king's servants, is will we cause the desert in which we are, into which we are sent to be better for us being there? Or will we cause it to be worse for the wear and the tear and the noise and the stench and the filth that we carry as opposed to the holiness of God? Now, the, last week, as we began Parsha of Midbar, the Holy One did something that was not particularly popular among today's world. After connecting very powerfully with each individual, if you're not redeemed, if you don't know the beauty and the majesty of, of your personal redemption and forgiveness and the healing that's taken place in your life, 
then the, what he did in, in Numbers chapters 1 and 2 will not make any sense to you. You'll hate it with a passion. But if you do understand his forgiveness and his mercy and his kindness and what he has done to you and how much you have been loved and how much you have been forgiven and how much mercy has been shown to you, then you will be ready for the next part of the process. And last week he said, now, now that you know who you are and how much you're loved and you've received all these things, now go back into your families. Go back into your, your, your tribe. Go back into your clan. Go back into your father's house. I want you to go back in there, and I want you to reconnect with people you've been estranged from. I want you to reconnect, and I want you to allow the kadusha you have received to spill out of you into their lives. It will not always be pretty. You will not just automatically be accepted, <laughs> and they will just not believe everything you say or agree with everything you do. But if you understand how much I love you, then you will understand how much I love them. Then you will understand it's not about how it makes you feel. It's about your purpose on earth and your destiny. So I send you back, every man to his tribe, a tribal banner. Get under the banner. The banner is not for show. The banner is to call you and say, I am connected to these people under this, under this tribal banner. Oh, but it's not just the tribal banner. <laughs> Then you, then you go within the tribal banner, you go within this, this clan's sign, the, the clan's flag. You know, flags are used for worship all the time. But what if the Holy One says that's not what their main purpose is? The main purpose of the flag is not for worship. The main purpose of the flag is to give you a sphere of influence because it tells you who your clan is. And then the next thing is the, the, the actual signal or the actual uh, uh, Banner, standard, the standard of the family. Raise up the standard of your family. Raise up the standard of your father and your mother. Raise up the standard of your brothers and your sisters. Raise up the standard of your extended family like aunts and uncles and cousins. Become a redeemer in your family, a kinsman redeemer. We studied, of course, during Shavuot, we studied the book of Ruth. And the whole idea of Boaz taking responsibility for his bloodline and for the, the inheritance of his bloodline. This is Take responsibility for your family. Take responsibility for your bloodline. So we embrace our kingdom identities and we learn to walk in our covenant callings uh, consistently. And we'll need to do that in the face of every kind of intense opposition you can imagine. Nothing's more intense than when your family gets all over you and gets all up in your face. Nothing's more intense than whenever you have to face uh, that look <laughs> that you know so well. When you have to overcome the pecking order of youth, whenever you were a kid, you were maybe not the oldest, and you were maybe not the strongest, maybe not the favorite, but now you've got to go back in there, and you've got to face the opposition and break through those barriers, break down those walls, uh, without uh, tearing down the entire structure. <laughs> uh, we'll face intimidating resistance. You, in your families, in your houses, in your worlds, you will face intimidating resistance and in your face challenges and I, the idea is are we prepared, are we ready, are we willing to keep exuding holiness and carrying the holy things in that process? The, uh, we will have, we will need to deal with first what I call comfort zone disorientation. The wilderness is all about getting out of your comfort zone. I mean, I like a comfort zone. I have a place on my, on my couch that I like to, to sit whenever I'm tired, and I sit and just kind of chill for a while. I have a, a, a nice place in, in my office where I can sit and study the Torah and pray and read the Torah. This is my comfort zone. This is how I enjoy it. I like it when my family comes over on Arab Shabbat, and my, my extended family comes over, and we are friends, and we come and we have Arab Shabbat, and we we talk about the Torah, and we bless each other, and we, I love, that's my comfort zone. But in the wilderness, in stage four of the ultimate extreme bridal makeover protocols, comfort zones are out the window. Now it is every day, every challenge, every, every waking moment, we face another challenge to our comfort level. This is the test. This is the trial. This is the, this is the transformation time. So we have to do this through losing our comfort zone. So will we, will we overcome comfort zone disorientation? <laughs> I travel with people sometimes across the country, across the world. Uh, I go to Israel, for instance, or whatever we may go. And, and uh, it's interesting because I always warn them, you, 
this is not going to be your comfort zone. The time zone will be different. The people will be different. The languages will be different. The atmosphere will be different. There will be obstacles. There will be adversaries. There will be people who hate you. You will face people who hate you, who want to kill you. This is what you need to deal with. This is, this is what I call comfort zone disorientation. And the book of Numbers is to teach us how to live through and function and survive and thrive in comfort zone disorientation and yet to leave the places we go better than we found them. There's heat, cold, and sand in the face and blisters on the feet. There's discomfort. This is the discomfort zero. We, the desert is not a nice place. It's, not a, it's beautiful to look at in pictures. Or from the mount, from the airplanes, but when you actually walk in the desert day after day after day, when you're actually living there in the heat and the creatures and the sand fleas, and you deal with it on a real, this is not comfortable. It's not only outside of your orientation or your comfort zone. This is outside of your physical uh, uh, ability to handle stuff. It challenges it. There will be insects. There will be serpents. There will be predators. Sensory deprivation and bombardment cycles. Sometimes it'll feel like nobody's, you can't hear anything, you can't see anything. You're so bored with what you've seen. You're so uh, caught up in the mundane of one foot after another, one day after another, all sameness, all sameness. And then all of a sudden, here come the Amalekites charging out of the woods. That's you. And then your sensory bombarded. And suddenly, now you have Midianite women and, and, and uh, Moabite women. And they're doing their fancy dances and trying to entice you to go there. And, and suddenly you're sensory bombarded. So you go from sensory deprivation to sensory bombardment. Sounds almost like uh, enhanced interrogation techniques of the U.S. military or other forms of military. And so there's going to be this, this change in the bombardment. Then you're going to have uh, fatigue and exhaustion. <clears throat> you're going going to have fleshly distractions, seductions, and obsessions. You know, learning to deal with the flesh is learning is a, is a major part of learning to be like your Messiah, learning to become like Yeshua, learning to deal with the distractions of the flesh. Because a distraction quickly turns into a seduction. If you don't deal with it, it deal, it's like a, a seed becomes a sprout, becomes a plant, becomes a fruit-bearing organis organism. Well, that's what distraction does. If you don't learn to deal with distraction up front, it soon becomes a seduction, an enticement. And then if you let it keep going, it becomes an obsession. You can't get it out of your head. You can't stop thinking about it. You don't want to stop thinking about it. It becomes all you live for. And all these distractions are uh, interpersonal dramas, interethnic dramas, intercultural dramas, all, all sorts of stuff, plus appetite uh, enhancers, uh, all this you know, the MSG of, of, of emotion. MSG is to enhance your, your sense of taste. Well, uh, the news media, for instance, is your MSG for your emotions. It's designed to enhance your emotions where you are trigger and you flash and then you cause destruction in your house. And they, they are responsible for that, but you have cooperated with that. You've allowed it to become a obsession. So that will happen in the wilderness as well. There will be a tide cycle. A series of tide cycles of to toxic appetites. Do you understand how this works? The Holy One, creator of the universe, has set up the universe to work according to cycles. Now, when we get to, for instance, new moon, full moon. This is the, what, the 11th day of Sivan? Well, that should tell you, if you know about your times and seasons, if you just know about the moon phases, you'll understand this. We're three days away from a full moon. <laughs> that should tell you something about the tide of your emotions and the emotions of the people around you. The emotions of the people around you are being affected by the season that we're in. And your emotions are too. So you can look for spikes. The high tide of toxic emotions will take place. And toxic appetites and urges and desires of the body and the flesh will activate highly during this full moon season. And then 14 days later, you'll see it happen again at a lesser level, the new moon season. This, and this summertime, the heat, the long, hot summer, as we used to call it. And in the long, hot summer, what do you find? This is where all the, 
Riots in the streets take place. This is where all the anger is, is, is so palpable and so tangible. Everybody's mad about something. Everybody's upset about something. Everybody's caught up in either lust or anger or terror or fear. This, this is the long, hot summer, so we're in that season as well. The season of fleshly distractions, tidal waves of toxic appetites, emotions, and rhetoric. With emotions and with appetites, up ratchets the rhetoric. Everybody's language, everybody's vocabulary turns into incendiary bombs. Sarcasm. I know people seem to love sarcasm. Sarcasm is a tool of the serpent. Sar sarcasm is a way in which to take you out of being responsible citizens and becoming instead of the kingdom and instead becoming purveyors of negativity into your world. And so this idea of sarcasm will rise up and accusations will arise and... Uh, all sorts of, of negative speech will come forth in this season. <laughs> ah. With our return to a focus on our families and our households, inner family drama will take place. It, the things that have always been out there, the things that we've always squabbled with, the things that we've always dealt with, the relational challenges of being brother or sister to somebody, Esau and Yaakov, Yitzhak and, and uh, Yishmael. I mean, the, these things will take place. Your problems with your siblings, your problems with your children, your problems with your grandparents, uh, your, your parents, all will come up to head. This is that season because we have to learn to deal with these things. We have to be above these things. We have to learn how to not only... Uh, survive them and thrive during but to leave the world better for our participation in them. Our own deep-seated insecurities and pathologies from childhood will raise their heads. I, I'm not going to tell you what yours are. I'm not going to tell you what mine are. <laughs> but in our childhood, in our youth, from the womb on, we have dealt with certain things that have internalized. We have internalized them and now these sort of things pop out and this is the time of year this is the season of the testing that they will come out and we will have to learn to either put them shove them back in again like uh, uh, whack-a-mole and but they're gonna pop back out again until we deal with them. this is our season to deal with them uh, interpersonal dramas uh, and then I call it the this is when the season when the IEDs there are IEDs in our road IEDs that we have taken for granted and think thought are somehow beneficial to us, but they're explosive devices in our pathway. And that is, those things are focuses on ethnicity, our ethnicity versus somebody else's, our culture versus somebody else's, the differences. We focus on the differences between our ethnicity or our skin color or our religion or our faith walk and somebody else's. That is an IED waiting to explode waiting for just the right person to step on it and make it go boom and cause as much damage and havoc as possible. We are not designed. We are, that's all on the flesh. In the spirit, we have no ethnicity. We have no color. We have no, we, we have no religion. We, we are all sons and daughters of the living gods, eternal beings living in flesh bodies that have these characteristics. Gender issues will arise. Uh, culture, class, economic class issues will arise. And we'll begin to, these are IEDs waiting to explode when somebody steps in them. It ratchets up the vocabulary, ratchets up the uh, rhetoric. And then ideology and politics. Those things will also erupt in great ways. And sarcasm will come forth. Then accusation will come forth. Scandal will erupt. And all sorts of distractions uh, and obsessions will arise. Wow. And then there, of course, there really are going to be real enemies that pose ex existential threats. If you're a Jew walking the streets of New York or the streets of Los Angeles, understand you are under an existential threat. If you are, and it will spread. It will spread to Miami. It will spread to Tampa. It will spread to Houston. It will spread to Dallas. It will spread probably some stage to Texarkana and the cities and wherever you live. It will spread to Australia. It will spread to New Zealand. It will spread to Israel. It's already in Israel. It's really, hey, everything starts there. Now, this is that issue. There are existential threats. I'd rather worry about those or think about those than all the other stuff I've been mentioning. <laughs> well, 
Let's talk about Parsha, not so specifically, because I see my time is running away from me. I want you prepared for the wilderness, though. And that's the main important thing I want to talk about today, is getting you prepared for this wilderness challenge. This is not to punish you. This is not so you'll suffer. This is so you can do everything God puts you on earth to do and accomplish the purposes for which he sent you and thrive in the process of doing so and become a great nation, a blessing to every household and to every family on the face of the earth. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get into this. First words 